are lucky to have another distinguished academic here with us. Uh, he is the Associate Professor in Political Economy and Human Development, and he is the Director of South Asia Studies here at the University of Oxford. He started as an economist, but then life got more and more complicated. Uh, studied BA in Economics at King's College, Cambridge. He did his MPhil in Economics from Keble College, Oxford. Uh, did his PhD from SOAS and then taught at SOAS for 11 years. He returned to Oxford in 2011 and took over as the Director of South Asia Studies from uh, Barbara, uh, Barbara Harris-White. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Matthew McCartney. Okay, well, big thanks in particular to Faraz who uh, invited me to the conference. A little bit of arm twisting, but uh, very pleased to be here. So I'm Matthew McCartney. I'm an economist by background, but I thought, you know, I specialise in India and Pakistan since independence is my particular area. And I thought, rather than boring you with lots of data and graphs, I'd have a look at this, this idea of leadership, this idea of Pakistan, and give you a kind of personal reflection of you know, my perceptions of Pakistan as very much an outsider. I study Pakistan, but I have no particular family connections to Pakistan. So I've come to Pakistan as a visitor, as a guest, as an academic. Okay, so my puzzle here is the portrayal of Pakistan in the rest of the world, the media publications. Um, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is not the rest of the world being a bit mean to Pakistan. Unfortunately, one of the things that frustrates me about Pakistan is how often people in Pakistan or Pakistanis are negative about their own country. Something very different happens in India. People in India are very positive, like to sell India. Something very different happens in Pakistan. So I'm going to have a look at how Pakistan is portrayed. I'm going to have a look at comparison, but very different portrayal of India. And then I'm going to make an argument, you might disagree with me here, that this is not really based on fundamental and objective differences between India and Pakistan. And I'm going to make a kind of final point that you as the future leaders of, well, current and future leaders of Pakistan, that this is a problem and it does really need changing. Okay, so here's my first slide. Uh, what is a leader? I have no particular idea what a leader is, but I know there are certain things we associate with leaders. Right, here's two very handsome chaps, uh, Imran Khan, someone who was a leader he inspired by his talent. He was perhaps the best bowler, best batsman in the world um, during parts of the 1980s. Here's a nice picture of Zulfikar Bhutto, looking as always very charismatic. He was a leader inspired people by his charisma, inspired some of the poor people of Pakistan to hope. Uh, two here, uh, next slide, I think, uh, two non-Pakistanis, uh, that is Mr. Stalin, who inspired, he was a leader, he inspired by fear. Um, here's a nice picture of Napoleon, um, looking rather dramatic. Um, Napoleon inspired by genius, people following him believed he was going to win them battles, he was going to win wars, he was going to conquer, someone who inspired by genius. Now, Pakistan is a democracy. Uh, thankfully, fear and genius are perhaps less important in democracy. Talent may be also a bit less important in a democracy. Charisma, of course, in a democracy is important, but it's not enough to be a leader. I would say representation is something very important part of being a leader in a democracy. One might win without a majority of the vote, but as a Prime Minister, as a leader, one has to represent the whole of a country. I found a definition here of representation. I'm speaking on and acting on behalf of another. So a democratically elected leader is someone that speaks and acts on behalf of his constituents or her constituents, so makes decisions on people's behalf regarding taxation, regarding education, regarding laws, for example. <coughs> Um, but my point here is that as future leaders of Pakistan, whether you're living in England, whether you're living in Pakistan, whether you're a second, third generation Pakistani, even perhaps whether you're just interested in Pakistan, you're in part your representatives of Pakistan, that you're speaking on behalf of Pakistan. That is what leaders do. My um, kind of argument here is that there are obviously many leaders in Pakistan, many leaders in Pakistan. 
There are people in Pakistan who represent, who speak on behalf of relatively small groups within Pakistan. There are those who speak on behalf of the military, those who speak on behalf of particular religions or religious groups, of business groups, of regions, of students, of women, of different language groups. But there are, I would suggest, few leaders of Pakistan, those people who, whether in Pakistan or out of Pakistan, are speaking on behalf of the whole of Pakistan. This, I would suggest, is a relatively big challenge. It's a problem. It's something not obvious, uh, often recognised, and it is and has become a crucial problem. <clears throat> so how, then, is Pakistan represented? Right, imagine I've switched to my next slide. Um, slide says, uh, how are uh, Pakistan and its people represented? Um, that little section below, this is a little bit of research I did yesterday. I went to the Guardian uh, newspaper website, very highly reputed British newspaper, I'm sure all of you have seen it. It's regarded as being quite liberal, it's regarded as being quite positive, uh, cosmopolitan. It tends to challenge status quo, so it tends to look behind headlines or accepted headlines. And I typed in the word India and I typed in the word Pakistan to search for recent news stories from the Guardian newspaper relating to those two countries. And perhaps not surprisingly, everything that came up about Pakistan was negative. Almost everything that came up about India was positive. And I've picked like, the first five um, news stories that came up uh, in the Guardian relating to India and Pakistan. So regarding India, there was a nice story about India's conservation efforts, uh, the tigers. Uh, there was a nice story that the opposition had accepted Modi's victory in the election, admitted defeat and hence acknowledged the new prime minister. There were nice stories about India's Mar Mars mission, its technological um, dynamism. Uh, there was a story there about how India was bringing power, bringing electricity to its villages. So positive portrayals. Yes, OK, India's got conservation problems, it's got villages without electricity, but these are positive stories. These are stories of overcoming <laughs> adversity. We look at stories about Pakistan. Kalash Valley culture at risk from the Taliban. Drone strikes killing militants. Uh, Malala Yusuf, pride of Pakistan but can't go home. Um, tens of thousands of anti-government protesters swarming swarming towards Pakistan's parliament. And finally, what have, what ha why have donations for Pakistan flood relief been so low? So we see a country, again, with problems, but there's an emphasis on those problems, not on the solutions. There's very clear two narratives, two stories here, positive about India, overcoming adversity, negative about Pakistan. So then I had a look at uh, books that have been recently published on India and Pakistan. So moving on here to the next slide, uh, there's India, the rise of an Asian giant by Arvind Panagariya. Yes, there's a nice picture there, there's a woman um, harvesting paddy, uh, there's a picture of a call centre. So the obvious story, India is a land of contrast, it has modern, it has traditional. There's a book by Owen Bennett-Jones, who I think is talking tomorrow, a threatening image, threatening eyes, there's an explosion in the background, somebody disguised. Um, Pakistan, eye of the storm. Next two books, there's, oh sorry, this is the, this is the one by Ar Arvind Panagariya. India, an emerging giant, Arvind Panagariya, we see the skyscrapers in the background, we see pictures of a shanty town in the foreground. So there's, yes, there's inequality, but there's also wealth, there's dynamism. Compare that to um, Pakistan, deep inside the world's most frightening state. There's threatening people, there's guns, people whose faces you can't see, there's some kind of beards, there's, it's a threatening picture on the front of that book. Again, two more. There's India Rising by uh, Oliver Bouch. There's a, a, a modern looking building in the background, a rickshaw in the foreground. Again, yes, India is a land of contrast, there's wealth, there's tradition, but India is about change, it's India rising. Let me look at the book by book cover by Ahmed Rashid, Pakistan on the brink. Um, it's a conflict, there's explosions, there's, we can't see any faces, it's a threatening image on the front of that book. And that is very typical of publications about India and Pakistan. There was nothing particularly scientific or representative about this survey, but this is a decent sample 
um, reasonably representative sample of the types of books that are being published about India and Pakistan. Again, acknowledge, yes, India has problems, it's poor, there's inequality, but there's a dynamism about India, there's a change about India, whereas Pakistan, it's about threat, it's about conflict, it's about explosions. Now, I'm an economist, so uh, next slide here, a few economic facts. Very common to hear Pakistan is an economic failure, India is the economic success. That's a very common perception, even amongst scholars of the economy of India and of Pakistan. Rarely find scholars who look at both economies in similar detail. Um, quite remarkably, um, I looked at data from the World Bank from 1960 up to about 2011, I think the most recent data. Pakistan is one of the few countries in the world never during that 50 plus year period to have a recession. So Pakistan has had more than 50, 60 years of positive economic growth. Now I'm not aware of any country in the world that's had positive economic growth for that long, sustained economic growth. Economic growth in Pakistan since independence has averaged about 5%. So it's not certainly on a par with the very rapid economies, the South Koreas, the Japans, the Taiwans, but then no economy in human history, or at least the last 250 years, has attained growth like that. 5% growth puts Pakistan as among the, the faster growing countries in the world, if not quite a miracle economy. And the average is almost identical to India's average over the last 60 years. <coughs> so volatility in recession. Pakistan has never had a recession. It's actually been one of the most stable economies in the world in the last 60 years. We look at Latin America, booms in the 1970s, complete busts in the 1980s, sub-Saharan Africa, negative economic growth for much of the post-independence period. Even what some people call the lost decade of Pakistan in the 1990s, what that actually meant was it had positive but slower economic growth. It wasn't quite as successful as the 1980s. Um, exports diversification, we often, people often think of Pakistan or label Pakistan, it's a feudal country, agriculture, it's traditional, it's backward, it's feudal, it's exploitative. If we looked at Pakistan at the moment of independence, some 99% of Pakistan's exports consisted of raw materials. So in large, exporting raw cotton to mills in Calcutta, in Ahmedabad. By the mid-1990s, about 80% of Pakistan's exports consisted of manufactured goods. Forget about South Korea and Taiwan, that was one of the most dramatic cases of diversification, economic diversification, um, among any developing countries. Um, we sometimes think of uh, Pakistan policy failures, policy paralysis, people are too concerned with politics, with conflict, with coalitions that rise and fall, and not serious about policy. However, have a look at the World Bank doing business report or any recent publication. Pakistan is and has quite long been a much freer and more open economy than India. So indices like the protection of private property rights or investors' rights, they're better in Pakistan. Pakistan has very long been much more open and hospitable to foreign direct investment than has India. Now, I'm not just, as my friend Iktiha, I'm not trying to sell Pakistan as some sort of utopia success necessarily. Um, Pakistan has, does have some very profound development failures. Pakistan's growth, although positive, has not been well translated into improvements in health and education. But then so has the rest of South Asia, with the possible exception of Sri Lanka, maybe Bangladesh in recent years. Uh, it's worth remembering for the first 50 years of independence, Pakistan was much better at reducing poverty than was India. Now, what does Pakistan have to celebrate? An awful lot would be my answer to that question. Um, moving on to here to the next slide, looking at some of the history of Pakistan, or the history one can go and see in Pakistan. Now, some of the great symbolic places and icons of South Asian culture and history that most people one would talk to would associate with India are actually in Pakistan. So Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, the Indus Valley civilization, early urbanization there in Pakistan. The tomb of Jahangir, one of the great moguls, it's in Pakistan, not in India. The birthplace of Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh religion, is in Pakistan. Um, the Mahabharata, one of the great Indian epics, was probably written in what is now um, 
Pakistan on the banks of the Indus, in Pakistan being the home of the Indus civilization. Paxila, one of the great centers of Buddhist learning, that again is in Pakistan. Lahore, uh, the great center of cuisine, uh, it's great South Asian city, but it's in, located in what is now Pakistan. So all of those icons, most people would associate probably with India, but they're in Pakistan. Why does nobody know that? Now, you might at this point want to say, OK, Pakistan, perhaps it's not as bad as people make out. But of course, India is now doing much better than Pakistan. Is it so obvious, I would suggest? Well, political extremism. Most people would think, immediately think, Pakistan must be the place of political extremism. Well, Pakistan does not have, as does India, a massive uh, Maoist movement dedicated to the overthrow of the state. Um, some time back, um, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh said that 200 of India's 600 districts would, they had been taken over by the Maoists, and this represented the most severe threat to India since independence. That was during the last few years. Um, we might, or many people, would associate Pakistan, not India, with religious extremism. However, many people, those same people, look quite, tend to look quite surprised when you point out religious parties never get more than about 5% of the vote in national elections. It's big secular parties, big alliances, big coalitions uh, that tend to get the votes in Pakistan. Uh, Narendra Modi um, came to power as the new Prime Minister of India, winning about 30% of the vote. And many scholars, I think, would agree that he is a more extremist religious figure than the Sharifs or the Bhutos, the leaders of the two main parties in Pakistan. Um, bombs, people, you look at the news, you look at those books, it's Pakistan, of course, that has the bombs, not India. Yes, Pakistan does have a huge problem with terrorism. Um, over the last decade, this is deaths from terrorist violence, civilians, um, security forces and terrorists, some 60,000 people estimated to have been killed in terrorist violence in Pakistan in the last decade. That is an appalling figure. Uh, however, in India the figure is about 25,000. Not quite as much, but a huge number of people are killed in terrorist violence in India. And this has been a relatively peaceful decade for terrorism in India. If we back, went back to the previous decade, then the figures are probably higher than they were in Pakistan. So India does have its own huge problems with terrorism, but we don't read about them, we don't associate them with India. What about democracy? This is the thing that most people immediately latch onto as the big difference between India and Pakistan. India, one of the three or four developing countries that has sustained, a bite with that, that small interlude under Indira Gandhi, sustained democracy since independence. Pakistan is the place that keeps falling prey to dictatorships. Obvious, huh? Well, people do forget that Pakistan is also the country that's had three mass uprisings against military dictatorships, three Arab Springs that have deposed military dictatorships and demonstrated the passionate attachment of the mass of the population of Pakistan to democracy. Um, sometimes, looking here now at my very last slide, sometimes thinking about or looking at South Asia and looking at the borders actually obscures our understanding of South Asia. But to look at the continent, look at that, the region and think it's about Pakistan compare contrast to India, it's about comparing Sri Lanka to the rest of South Asia, it's about looking at how uh, Bangladesh is now forging ahead to start with the existence of those borders. And I would suggest quite often that obscures rather than helps our understanding. Now, as an economist, also read some anthropology, other subjects, the Pakistan, also this is actually a very personal interpretation, crossing the border from Pakistan into India, I can't tell the difference. If I was, it's the same food, it's the same language, it's the same culture to my mind. And I think anthropologists who've looked at these questions in greater detail tend to agree. And myself as an economist, a lot is actually very similar between North India and Pakistan, the status of women, how politics operates, um, the relatively poor indicators of development like health and education, 
you don't find that much difference between North India and Pakistan. South India is very different. They do much better on indicators of human development, for example. And I think that a better way of starting to think or starting to understand the region is to look at language, the spread of language. So you can see that massive sway of the Indo-Aryan language across Pakistan into North India. That is the part of South Asia where women have relatively low status, poor levels of human development. We can see the frontiers of Pakistan very different again. We can see that area of South India, the Dravidian languages, caste system is there, very different there from North India or Pakistan. That is the place where women have a much greater status. So I think in a lot of ways, in order to understand South Asia, we should forget about borders and look at something like the spread of language. <clears throat> so as leaders of Pakistan, I think there is an important obligation on you to represent Pakistan, just not just in Pakistan, but in the rest of the world. Now, Pakistan does have its problems, but Pakistan is not exclusively defined by those problems. Too often, looking at those images of Pakistan, the way Pakistan is portrayed in the West, we can get the impression Pakistan is just about problems. But I would argue, having visited, having had many wonderful trips to Pakistan, Pakistan is not exclusively defined by those problems. Pakistan is a land rich in history, in art, in music, in culture, in politics and debate. And it is really time leaders of Pakistan represented Pakistan. People became leaders of Pakistan, not just leaders in Pakistan. Thank you.